swear, if Tony Stark was not fictional and he was making an Iron Man suit right now, this is precisely how. incredibly noisy and it's absolutely magical to watch him just bring in his arms and rise off the ground as if he's just sort of hanging from a string. I'm, I'm literally like less than to take files from the Marvel Studios for Iron Man, um, convert them into buildable objects that we could then send to our partner on this, EOS, uh, who fabricated all the parts. One of the requirements we were given was to make the parts as thin as possible uh, because we were trying to minimize weight. We use a laser beam to melt metal powder. Uh, the metal powder is about 40 microns in diameter, so it's like half the human hair. We spread a layer of powder across the build platform. The laser selectively scans and melts this powder, uh, and then it builds it up layer per layer uh, based on the geometry. And once it's done, you remove the powder, and there's your part. We are so far out on the cutting edge of the printing technology and the armor and the, the, the metallurgical qualities of the titanium that it sounds like hyperbole, but I swear, if Tony Stark was not fictional and he was making an Iron Man suit right now, this is precisely how he would do it, and this is the exact technology he'd be using. Kill power. There's components made of titanium. There's components made of urethane, some flexible pieces. Uh, we also have fiberglass. We have some pieces 3D printed in nylon. I think over, over 280 parts for the whole suit. There's a couple of different uh, pieces of, of mechanics that are going on. So there's the hinge in here, which I don't know if you can see that. Um, the hinge, which kind of floats a little bit. Um, these will be these will be tightened down once we're ready to put them onto Adam. And then on the inside here, um, we have this webbing, which is going to actually come up and connect to. This will buckle in on the back across the back of Adam, and uh, these will connect to each other. These are urethane palms. feel all these engines, all five engines all around you go from zero and cold up to sitting at about 30,000 RPM and idling. And you can just feel this sensation of power.
All we do from there is just progress to ever greater degrees of power and eventually it'll be enough that if, he, if he's got the control he should be able to vector it down and, and blow enough air downwards that he should come off the ground and then after that it's just all this intuitive sense of balance and control. If you're reasonably light, reasonably strong, you've done some kind of sporting endeavor that involves spatial awareness, things like rock climbing or gymnastics or maybe piloting a helicopter, all those things seem to point towards allowing your brain to learn this balance and control quick. I do have a lot of circus training. I have a very good sense of balance. Uh, I taught myself to ride a unicycle when I was 15. Hello, ladies. Uh, but this is totally different. As you might have noticed from one of his last goes, as he's just about to take off, he, his feet tend to kick backwards. And, and it's like a human instinct to when you feel like you're gonna fall forwards. Um, he needs to kind of go with it and relax into it. And so the moment of lift off, his feet are just gonna literally just gently lift off. Well done! <laughs> that was the most fun. It feels like wearing a massive wetsuit, but it's, it's, it's cool. I'm amazed it's all gone on so well. I just kind of landed in a really quite painful way. It's a very strange curve that's in the, in the shin part of the suit. I don't know why, I'm sure it looks really cinematic, but my shins don't have a banana-like curve, I'm pleased to say. I've driven everything from an Indy car, in which I didn't pop the clutch, to a Zamboni, uh, but I have never tried a device like this. The number of different things and threads and connections that came together to make this work, including my friendship with Richard, is it's like this perfect kismet.